or no, we have to read off the paper. Second. Three minutes to start. It'll oh, okay. Oh, I see. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Avanatis, my name is Megan Bernoni. I work for First Nations Health Authority as Director of Quality. And just to make sure you're in the right place, this is C4, partnering to improve Indigenous health and care experiences. Uh, we like to start off all our sessions by acknowledging the territory in which we're all very blessed today to attend the Quality Forum of the Coast Salish people, the Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam, and Squamish. And I'm going to let each of the uh, presenters come up and introduce themselves. But just a reminder that on all of your seats, you have an evaluation form. And the reason that Quality Forum gets better and better every single year is because we look at those very carefully. So please fill them out before you leave. And I'm just going to welcome up uh, Victoria and Verna for Aboriginal Indigenous Health Improvement Committees. Lou M. Gotti, Newell Gassam, it is good to see you all. Verna and I are here on behalf of hundreds of people who are participating in the Aboriginal and Indigenous Improvement Committees, and we are here to represent their work today. Please note at the end, there's also three handouts at the back if you're interested. And thank you to the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations for their welcome this morning. We're honored to be here. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Verna Howard. I'm the um, community engagement go coordinator for the Gitsan and Watutin area. Uh, I work for First Nations Health Authority. And I'm Victoria Carter with Northern Health Indigenous Health Team. And um, my, I'm adopted by the Niska, and my Niska name is Nox Amagot, which means mother of good heart. I'm a mother of two girls who um, carry my European ancestry and their father's uh, Niska ancestry. Where are we? Where is it going? 
Okay. Um, what are AHICs? Um, the indigenous people of um, northern BC and living um, pe and uh, people living in remote areas in BC. The AHICs were created to address um, and work collaboratively with the uh, uh, Northern Health, First Nation Health Authority, Indigenous Health leaders, and others to to look at um, health care priorities of the First Nations people and to work together to uh, towards potential solutions. A lot of the issues that are coming forward are from our First Nations people, and they don't necessarily bring it forward to the hospitals or to any other area. Um, they bring it forward to us, our, our own people, and that's why it's really important that we are sitting at the same table as the Northern Health and um, all the other agencies that come to sit to us on the table. And why do they work? Well, um, Northern Health put out uh, patient experience surveys and um, the concepts raised by AHEX uh, is to address all these issues. The, um, no the Northern First Nations Health um, Partnership Committee, uh, that's First Nations Health Council and uh, First Nations Health Authority and Northern Health. They they have the um, partnership committee. They created the partnership committee, and so they are. Um, they also bring forward the all the issues and concerns, and not just that, but the health um, directors that sit around the table at the AHICS and IHICS. They bring all the concerns forward to be addressed, and they um, they have identified gaps in care, falling and um, people falling through the cracks, feeling racialized, and difficulty accessing services. This is why they've created the AHICS. And so, in to order to address that, Northern Health is committed to cultural safety and in 2015 signed a Declaration of Cultural Safety and Humility. And Northern Health, Health staff and facilities work hard to try and address these uh, gaps that Verna has identified. And um, some of the things that they've done is support the Sanya's online cultural safety training for staff to take that. Um, but we constantly hear that, we, that communities and Northern Health staff would like um, training that focuses on local nations, cultures, and histories. Additionally, there's many operational challenges that we face in Northern Health. For example, a number of the staff don't know what services are available in communities and don't know uh, the travel challenges that patients face coming in. And so that can lead to discontinuity in care. It can lead to um, misscheduling of appointments and missed appointments. And so, um, learning these things are, are the, the gaps that are being brought forward by the Indigenous Health Improvement Committees to work together in collaboration. So how do the, um, these committees do their work? Well, uh, for what, two of the big things that they focus on is the uh, cultural resource development. And over 65 cultural resources have been developed by these nine committees. And they support increased understanding of local indigenous communities, cultures, and barriers to care. And more than 25 patient pro journey or process mapping reports have been done, again, that identify working together to look at what are the challenges and how we can collaboratively address them. Um, the AHIGS um, implemented a process of patient journey mapping, process and patient journey mapping is called. And um, they invited all the stakeholders there. Um, we had Northern Health, mental health uh, counselors, uh, MCFD, health directors from the First Nations communities, Gitchan Child and Family Services, and other independent people that sat together to, to participate with the patient journey mapping. and. Um, this is to um, build greater understanding between each other and the services they provide and um, to work collaboratively to, for the betterment of our people and uh, to empower everyone to know what kind, um, how to implement those services because a lot of the times they implement in the way that they understand but they don't really know the way that we have in our own communities what's acceptable to us. So this is something that really um, 
well, I guess what's innovative problem solving is what they'll call it in the English language. But yes, coming together with the First Nations people and discussing all these things is really important. And um, in doing that, we've had uh, cultural resource development. Um, a lot of the cultural resource development we had was implementing workshops. Um, uh, patient information card was p put in place by some areas, the AHICs across the area. Not everybody have gone, have done this, but the, some of them have. And we've had uh, the patient information cards hold their personal information, their cultural information, and their health information. Like in our area, we have, um, we're from clans, we're from certain clans, and so there are certain responsibilities that come with that, being the father clan or the uh, matrilineal side. So that information is really important on the cards who needs to respond when they come to the hospitals. And then, so this is something that really is put uh, shared on the information there. And then we uh, created videos also and materials on cultural practices, beliefs, and healthcare needs. Some of them that have been created are like the ones that I participate. I participate on two AHICs. That's the Smithers AHIC and the Terrace AHIC. And the, um, we've implemented the cultural, um, created the videos. The cultural practices around birth was one of the videos that we have that can be found on the Northern Health website. And we also have the cultural practices around uh, critical illness and death. That's also another important uh, video that has been shared. And this was, those videos included the Nishka, the Heisla, the Simshian, and the Gitsan. And uh, we also had information sharing fees. So there's so much more details to share, but we have limited time. <laughs> and there is, a, there is handouts at the back with all of these in there. So please take advantage of those. So in addition, all the AHICs get, get together every year, roughly, to get together and sh learn and share from each other and meet with other Northern Health staff. So we've had five gatherings, each one, over 120 people at each. So another great opportunity. And then to discuss the impact quickly, you know, this, how have these AHICs and IHICs changed things? Well, they have impacted relationships. We've heard so many times about how um, now community members have relationships with Northern Health staff or First Nations Health Authority have relationships, so, so they contact them. So the spin-off beyond the community work is huge. Additionally, partnerships. When we come together at that all AHIC gathering, we sit down together, we have speakers, and we learn about, you know, how can we work together to prevent racism, to prevent marginalization, and we brainstorm on that. Equity. One of my greatest... Um, moments was when uh, in Prince Rupert when they brought together elders and they said what do we said to them what do you want to do and they wanted to bring people together to train and talk about reconciliation and preventing root causes of child sexual abuse and I was scared to death but it was a powerful amazing event that I can't tell you uh, it still rocks me um, and in addition to that there's changes in impacts in care, people go away from the mapping events and go back and change things because they didn't know these were gaps. We've heard um, numbers reached. One video alone, um, the Honoring Our Journey video, has uh, had over 1,300 uh, views. The cultural learning sessions Verna talks about has had uh, over th several hundred people attend them. And these are reached with um, only $10,000 to $20,000 per AHIC per year. So great amount of stuff done. And lots of spread happening, people learning from each other and so forth. So I think that's, that's our time. So what we wanted to do to thank you is just if you could turn to someone beside you and just ask yourselves one of those questions and talk for about two minutes before we open it up to questions. You know, would a partnership like these AI HICs work for your, you in your area of work? Or would the development of these kind of cultural resources or patient process mapping work in your area of work? So just turn to someone to side, beside you for like two minutes and then we'll open it for questions or comments. <laughs>
I know, really. Imagine how loud this is. <laughs> well, at least they're talking. <laughs> it's not quiet, so that's good. Hello. We got um, our two minutes are up. I know you have a lot more ideas, but we're going to be moving forward. So now we'll open it up to questions or comments. Maybe something came up in your conversation you want to share. We have about eight minutes, but um, we'll have the mic here. So please uh, wait for the mic to come to you. So comments, questions? It is being live streamed, that's why we need to make sure you're on the mic. I came very late, so you might have answered this already, but I was curious about how the Aboriginal Patient Navigator fits into all of this uh, in an acute setting. So I work at Kelowna General Hospital, and we take our lead from the APNs a lot. I'm the spiritual health practitioner there, so we work, we work closely together. Uh, and we'd probably take Gloria's lead on a lot of this. And I just wonder if you have any experience with that. Well, we have um, Aboriginal patient liaison workers where we're at. I, I don't think we have any navigators in our area, but they do participate with the uh, Aboriginal and Indigenous Health Improvement Committee meetings. So they do participate and they do also support the planning for some of the work that we're doing. Thank you. My name is David. I'm a family doctor who works in the inner city part of Vancouver. And I just want to first say I'm amazed at how much work you accomplished on such a, what I would say, an insufficient budget, 10 to 15,000 to do all the work you're doing, which is complex work. Um, and I'm sure it utilizes lots of volunteer hours and lots of spirit there. But uh, yeah, it's amazing that what you've accomplished with what you've been provided with. Um, and I guess I have a question just about thinking about the an, an urban or, or off-reserve um, context where it is often dis difficult to see who, who represents the community um, when there's not a structure. And certainly if I think of the downtown east side, which is where I've worked for the last 20 years, you know, it's a struggle to say, well, who represents the, the community here? It's, it's such a diverse, and if you have any thoughts about how to apply what you've learned to that sort of urban off-reserve context where there are a lot of indigenous people are, are, are indeed living start maybe Verna can finish but our, um, our committees are actually include urban and um, First Nations communities so we have friendship houses we have other indigenous organizations represented on them and so it's a collaborative coming together and so the, this the challenges are identified in both contexts um, your main connection would be the um Friendship centers, I believe, because they bring forward the elders, they bring forward all those resources that you need to have the cultural learning. And um, yeah, so uh, they have those connections and they also know um, who would be the best for you to bring forward to be a part of that. Any other comments or questions? I just want to share also that there is um, also First Nations Health Authority, and they do have a lot of resources that have, they've utilized in the um, in the urban setting, work because a lot of our meetings are conducted in the urban setting with for our chief and councils, so um, and the health leads. So they do have uh, a lot of resources that they're familiar with from almost well all across BC. So anybody had something they thought about when they talked to their neighbor they'd like to share? One of the great things that we're finding is, is it's the collaboration. It's the, 
you know, the many partners coming together and um, so the solutions are being generated together. And it's all across the north. So um, one of the things I didn't mention too is there's a Métis um, Indigenous and Aboriginal Health Improvement Committee as well that has a regional focus. And one of the things they've done is worked on um, data sharing agreements and memorandums of understanding which will build the foundation for future partnerships. Some of the other uh, Aboriginal and Indigenous Health Improvement Committees have worked on, uh, in addition to videos, they've created resources on the culture and protocols that will not only be a resource to, to staff learning but also to community and they'll last and you know for generations. Other really great examples of um, one, what, several of the groups have developed resource guides so that communities know who to contact and what are the services available in each community. So it's, it's, it's great work, so thank you. I just want to share also that um, we have um, a number of indigenous groups that we come together and work with. Like I mentioned, there's the Nishka, the Heisla, the Tsimsian, and the Gitsen, and the Taltan. Those are all the ones that I work with. And then there's also the Carrier on the other side. So um, when we do create um, any learning, we have to include almost every one of those um, and make sure that um, all the culture is shared about all those groups, specific groups, and because we're not all the same. We don't. We function and within our own culture, and we have our own ways of doing things, and we our own ways of understanding things. So we have, um, so the teaching and the learning is uh, shared by the people that come forward to to really share the knowledge that they have. So we've been really. Um, uh, I really enjoy that because it really creates a lot of. Um, you see the life of all the different communities around you and you see the life of the people and you're, you're learning all about it. And um, one person shared with me at one gathering we had, because we had to share some food, and it is the food of the indigenous group where, the, where we had the healthy um, event. And um, people lined up to have the food and they're like, oh, what are we gonna have here? <laughs> so uh, my, my thing, I was, uh, we created the whole event, so I, had, I should share it with them. I said, well, uh, if you went to another country, you'd be trying different food, right? Well, let's pretend we're at a different country. You're just in Canada within our country, and this is some of the food that you're trying. So it was like, okay, and if it doesn't, it, uh, like, uh, you'd be surprised how, you know, you'll actually like it. <laughs> <laughs> it may not look, like, appealing, but you will, you know, you, you'll find that you'll like it, or it'll have some kind of um, texture that you're like, oh, didn't really quite expect that, that <laughs> kind of thing. You know, that kind of thing when you chew into it, it's just like seaweed, right? And, or no, herring eggs, herring eggs, people chew into that and then they're like, oh, wow, it's popping in my mouth, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. So those kind of things you experience when you go to different places. You experience it, and the life of the community is just, it's, uh, for us, we function around the, the food. Our communities function that way, and we celebrate that way. And I just have to say, our time's up. <laughs> Thank you. That is slick. It's already there. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for um, being a part of this presentation. Um, my name is Jill, and I am the executive director with the Central Ontario Rural Division of Family Practice. And we're here today with many of our partners from up in the Caribou, um, but I'm up here today with um, uh, one of our physicians from the region, Dr. Roddy, and Connie Jasper, who is with the Sukhothin uh, National Government, um, it, which is far, far away from here. Um, and together we would like to acknowledge that we are sharing our story with you today on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Thank you for having us. Are we in control? Oh. Uh, I'm sorry. Right area. Great. Um, so that is who we have. We do not have any to disclose so um, <laughs> we will just get started 
so I realize that um, this group isn't uh, possibly uh, familiar with um, the organizations that we're from, so the Divisions of Family Practice work with family physicians. So uh, today we're going to be talking about a project where um, the division has worked with um, the three nations that are in our region to, um, with a goal of increasing capacity and cultural sensitivity within primary care providers. So we're going to walk through some of the work that we've done and then specifically go into one part of our project which we will all elaborate on. So to give you a bit of a, the lay of the land, so where Central Interior Rural, what a name, where are we? Uh, we are about five, six hundred kilometers north here in the interior around Williams Lake, 100 mile house, and then our region spreads out um, into the Chilcotin and East Caribou area. Uh, so that is where we are and there are two things that are quite important as to how we brought this work together. One is specifically around our First Nations population. So we're not a very big region um, but we have uh, a high First Nations population and somewhat complicated landscape in that we have three nations and 12 First Nations communities um, in our region and roughly 18% of our population is First Nations and to put that into context within our health authority the sort of the average is around 7%. So that's one thing to take note. The other is around our primary care provider profile. Uh, so we have around 50 um, primary care providers in our region. Most are um, physicians. There are a handful of nurse practitioners and we have a lot of foreign physicians so we strongly rely on IMGs in our region so we have people that are uh, not just new to First Nations culture but brand new to Canada so uh, when you put that into um, a, a region uh, that is how we sort of um, came about this work. So um, we under, went, uh, had some work around the patient medical homes which was uh, something that was rolled out across divisions and through this work we had an advisory committee. The advisory committee had physicians, specialists, health authority partners, um, our nation representatives and we started looking at what some of the opportunities were and what some of the uh, sort of the features of the area are which were the First Nations population and the providers and realize that we have a real opportunity to look at increasing uh, cultural safety with our primary care providers. So that's where this idea came from. The project had three components. Um, the first was a uh, regional map that has a First Nations focus that will be put up again. Um, it shows driving distances to community where the health centers are, how many hundreds of kilometers of gravel road we have. Um, so re that was quite a neat tool that has been spread uh, quite widely across our region and uh, copied by um, multiple other divisions. Uh, we also looked at educational opportunities for primary care providers and put together uh, a database of all of the local, regional, provincial and federal um, learning opportunities that there are and then we actually had a, some curriculum tailored to the local area. So again, we were looking at the Sanyaz training, which is what's commonly rolled out, but that's not necessarily applicable to um, our region. So we worked with uh, the University of Northern British Columbia and put together a program that had, uh, was through storytelling with uh, two of our nations as the, as the leaders for that work, and we rolled that out. And then the third part, which we are going to elaborate on the most, was that we uh, realized that the best way to actually um, share the knowledge that we needed to do was to bring these providers, these new physicians, out to communities. So the training is great, but it, it's just a fraction of what the experience is really like and what, what people need to learn. So that's what we're um, elaborating on today. And we trialed um, three uh, we trialed three visits um, uh, and we have three different nations, so we did one per nation. Uh, so I'm going to, that's a great slide, uh, talk about some of the key learnings from the, the project perspective. Sorry about that. Um, and then uh, Dr. Roddy will talk about from her experience as being a physician on this trip and Connie from the nation perspective. So some of the key learnings from an organizational side of things, um, small groups were, were key. We, when we were sort of talking about this, we're like, you know, let's get 20 people out and let's do this. No, very small groups. Uh, that, that, was key, that was very key. So we took one to two physicians on each of the tours and that was uh, visits, sorry, and that was quite successful. 
Community participation is essential in the planning. So there's no way somebody can plan this uh, from their desk in Williams Lake. So we really needed that community participation. And uh, to allow for organic flow. We can't over plan this. And Dr. Roddy will share some of the sort of unexpected things that happened on her visit. And it was like that with every visit. So those are the key learnings from uh, my perspective and our organization's perspective. And I will hand it over to Dr. Roddy to talk about her experience. Thank you, Joe. You bet. So I'm Guy Darati. I'm one of the family physicians, um, and it's, I have only three minutes, so it's going to be really challenging. Wish me good luck. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm new to Canada. I moved to Canada in 2016, and Williams Lake was my first home, and so I had, you know, I had no idea. But just to give you an idea where I went, um, I went to Anaheim Reserve. I went to Tatla Lake, um, Anaheim Lake, which is also known as El Gacho, and I went all the way to Bella Coola, which is not shown on this. Um, so I traveled that road that my patients traveled to come and see me. Um, and I traveled it in July, which makes a big difference. So, um, you know, it's really hard to summarize this visit, but I'm going to just kind of mention the eye-openers for me and then what I've done to change my practice. So, first of all, um, the top picture there, there's Ruth. She's in the blue. She's um, the um, rural certified nurse, and we were there to visit, and she had an MVA patient. And she was struggling to get hold of the emergency doctor because she needed a, an order for morphine because the patient was in pain. So luckily I was there, I was able to give her an order. But that was just the first glimpse into what they suffer and what they go through. She, the, patient, the doctor had accepted the patient, Williams Lake, but you know, it takes time for the ambulance to get there. It takes time for the ambulance to transfer the patient. So it's about, I think, three and a half hours um, from Tatla Lake to Williams Lake. So that was one thing that really you know, surprised me. The other one um, is with Jeff. He's a community paramedic. I never heard of a community paramedic, and that was in El Gacho. And he said, you know what, let's go for a home visit today. And I said, cool, let's go. So we went, and it turned out to be one of my patients that I see in the oncology clinic, because I do GP oncology. And so I went in and I introduced myself, and I was so excited. And I said, yeah, I'm the doctor that sees you in, the, in Williams Lake in the oncology clinic. And we were talking, and we kind of realized that he was having trouble sleeping. So I said, you know what, you don't have to worry about coming into Williams Lake. I'm going to provide you with a prescription. Um, for a sleeping pill and he looked at me and he said only doctors can prescribe and I said well I'm the doctor and he said you're the doctor and I said yes I am he said I thought you were the receptionist of the doctor I keep yeah I keep coming back to my wife and I said I've never seen the doctor in Williams Lake I always see her separately. so so that was big and I said I am the doctor and I it really made me think because whenever they come into my clinic I do say I'm Dr. Roddy the nurse that takes their vitals says, you're going to see Dr. Roddy, but he assumed that I was the receptionist, so that was really strange. Um, so that's that. The other eye-opener for me, and this is not working, oh, here it is, resources. So I looked it up, Tylenol in Williams Lake is about seven and a half dollars. Look at how much it costs there. Like simple medications sometimes cannot be affordable. Look at the list of, I don't know if you can see this, but like, a, a pound of bananas in Williams Lake costs 66, 66 cents. It's a dollar and a half. So when I'm telling my patients eat healthy, it's actually cheaper to buy pop and junk food than to get, you know, milk and vegetables. So that was really a big eye opener for me. Um, and then, you know, I think this is the main important thing. What did I do? How did I change my practice? Before I mention that, and I took permission of my patient. Um, this was a patient that I met when I first moved, and I haven't seen her for a long time. And there she is walking out of the health center, and I was so excited and hugging her. And she said, so you're still my doctor? I said, yes, I am. She said, well, I thought because I haven't seen you for over a year, I'm not, I can't come and see you. And I said, no, you can come and see me. We still have that relationship. So that was another one. So what did I do? I adjust my appointments. I used to not understand. Why did they show up late? Now I understand. I traveled those roads in July, and it was... I don't want to talk about it here, we don't have time, but I can imagine how, you know, if their appointment is in the morning, they might not be able to make it. And so what I try to do now is I say, well, what's the best time for you? Is it at the end of the day? Let's book you at the end of the day. You know, is it at the end of the morning? And even if we do book them and they don't show up, the receptionist knows that I'm going to see them whenever they show up. Because I really now appreciate, you know, they're dri driven all that, you know, distance to see me. The other thing is, um, I know I now understand when they say, I need a note to stay in Williams Lake. Of course you need a note. There's, you know, a snowstorm out there. I'm not going to let you drive back on Highway 20 to go back. It's dangerous. So I sometimes even offer and say, I'm going to give you a note to stay in Williams Lake because I think you should stay. Um, the language and understanding with my patient, I, I thought that if I say I'm Dr. Roddy, he's going to understand. So I think, you know, basically I need to take time. And I know our appointments are 10 minutes, but we have nurses, you know, we have 
people that support us, our MOAs, we, sh we should really spend time explaining and not just taking a head nod from them that they understand. We need to go over it and over again. And if you can't do it as a physician, I think you have a big you know, team that can do that. And I'm now more comfortable reaching out to the nurses um, because I've met them and just say, you know what, I'm discharging this, this patient back home. Do you have the supplies that you, know, that you need to take care of these people? What do you need me to do as a physician? I sometimes now even write notes and say, I'm sending this patient back, please monitor their blood pressure, please monitor their blood sugar. Not just telling the patient, oh, just go to the health center and have them do that and that, because they won't remember, they might forget. I hope I didn't take over. No, I'm okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. And I'm handing it over to Connie. <laughs> Don't worry, Connie, you can do more than 20 seconds. <laughs> it says 20 seconds on here, so I'm going to hurry. <laughs> um, so Connie Jasper, health manager with the Silco Tea Nation. Our nation is um, west of Williams Lake. We have six communities. It's all rural and remote communities. And um, we had the opportunity to have, um, which one am I pushing? Yeah, 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 right. Oh, I went too far. Um, we had an opportunity to, to have um, Dr. Vandermeer come with us for the day. Her and her husband joined us and we wanted to make sure that we got to our most remote community for the day, but we were lucky enough to get to three communities on the way. And um, so we stopped in at each of the three health clinics and uh, met with the health staff. Um, we we're fortunate that the community of Clesco had their chief there, Chief Francis, and he was a very gracious host and talked about the health needs of the people in the community. We visited the second community, Unisatine, which is about 100 kilometers from Williams Lake, with, with part of that being Gravel Road. And there we have FNHA nurses, and they were able to share with the doctor their challenges around getting information after a patient has visited them at um, either visited the doctor or been in hospital and just getting the information back to community to find out what happened when they were visiting the doctor or what happened at the hospital. And we were able to sh they were able to share that they didn't have access to an EMR or Meditech at that time and just the challenges around that. And then the third community we visited was our remote community of Hanikwatin. And um, three hour drive from Williams Lake, um, most of it is with gravel roads. And on the way there, um, we met the greater operator and um, we stopped to talk to her and she was actually a patient of the doctors. And so the doctor climbed in the greater with her and had a conversation about healthcare with her and got to see firsthand the kind of work that people do. Um, in the community of Honey, we were able to um, visit a traditional site there, um, their pit house and their sweat house and, and um, showcase some of the, the stuff that's important to the community. And um, that community didn't have a nurse at the time and th that community needs a remote certified nurse. So um, we didn't get a chance to discuss the health needs, but we met with the health staff there as well. The, the, what the opportunity was for us was just to be able to showcase what we have in the communities. Most, I, most of the, the healthcare providers in Williams Lake don't realize there are services in communities. They, you know, and so they were able to showcase some of the, the work that goes on in community. The other thing was, as the doctor um, said, I feel really bad that somebody drives seven hours round trip to see me for 10 minutes and that I should be, you know, making, utilizing some of the services in community when we're talking about lab work and that kind of stuff. So it was an eye opener in that manner. And we really, um, we, you know, it was a learning from both sides. This wasn't the only opportunity. We had done some exchange with nursing from the hospitals and ER nurse exchanges to our communities to educate them as well. So this is something, this is a project that we think is really important and we want to continue on doing the work to ensure that um, we educate the doctors, um, that they give an opportunity to learn the culture and the area that people live. So we really appreciated the opportunity and we hope to continue it and um, the other nations as well. Um, Jamie's here from the Caldenay and, and um, the Sweat Nation as well. Like it's just something that we wanna keep going within our three nations within Williams Lake and the project. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, we did. Uh, so we started this through patient medical home funding. So that funding comes through GPSC through divisions uh, is, is where it originally came from. We are looking at um, expanding this work um, and try and continuing the overall project and the visits is one component of that and we have just put in an application for some funding to do um, that this year and then 
beyond, I think we're going, we're ambitious. We're going to try for three visits per nation. So we have, that would be nine visits. Whether or not we can achieve that, I don't know. And then beyond that, we'll be looking for a sustainability model. Not sure what that will look like. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm a doc from Prince George. I'm a nephrologist. Um, the question is, I see distance is a big problem. Um, have you considered doing telehealth or connecting with remote communities virtually? Yes, we, 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 can, yeah, we can talk um, about this for Yeah, so we do have, some of our communities do have um, the ability to, to have telehealth. The problem is, is that they're associated with a physician in the communities and not not all of our communities have a physician that's located there. Connectivity is another one that we're working on. So we don't have the, the internet capacity to run telehealth equipment in some of the communities and, and um, that is something that's being looked at this year. And so we're hoping that in the future we have more access to be able to do that. Thank you very much. I'm a psychiatrist in the north. I'm in Smithers. And um, at the time I moved to Canada, there was just one psychiatrist based in Terrace. So what one of my colleagues does now, we're three in the northeast, not west. I think there are about five in the northeast. One person travels to the communities, but this is something he just decided to do because he has an interest in in this, and, I, and the rest of us do a lot of coverage through telehealth. So it, you are right that having them drive for seven hours to see you for 10 minutes is tough. In my case, it's an hour, but still. So I found that since we've opened it up that way, that we can cover a lot more ground, and so I think the focus should really be on maybe looking for that connectivity or seeing if there are clinicians in your area that may be able to commit a visit every couple of months or something. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to <clears throat> make a comment with regard to what you mentioned earlier um, about um, when they come in to see you, the indigenous people, and then um, they, they only have 10 minutes, and then your communication with them, and then um, how they nod. For in our area, um, we had to teach our um, doctors that um, the nodding does not necessarily mean yes. So that, <laughs> it's like, okay, I'm listening to you. That's, that's what that nod means. It doesn't mean that they're agreeing with you. So we had um, an experience with one of our doctors where he had to come back how many, about three or four times for one client because the client was nodding and he thought that the client was acknowledging with a yes. Then we really, then he finally asked, they finally asked me, uh, the nurse, the local nurse and um, doctor came and asked me, what, what, what are we doing wrong? So I had to walk back track with them and they backtracked, and then I said, okay, we got yeah. this now. <laughs> there, he's not nodding yes. because he's nodding yes. He's nodding, he's acknowledging that he's listening to you. He, he's not acknowledging yes to you. Yeah. So that was huge. That was a, a big learning thing for me because, um, you know, we were limited by time, but I did sit with another um, kind of like a home support nurse, and she told me that the nod does not mean yes. So I know <laughs> that now, so I'm trying to share with everybody that a nod is not yes. So, I, yes, I learned it that way. And, and well, I, could, I think I would, even if I go another time, I would learn more and more. Yes. Right? Yeah. 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 And that's the same thing when we did our um, process mapping. The hospitals have no idea what's, av what's available at the health centers. They, yeah. There are so many assumptions there to say that they thought that they had all these uh, um, no bandages and equipment available to them. So what you guys are doing and, you know, creating that knowledge sharing between what's available in community and with, you know, what's available in town, that's a huge, huge work because there's a lot of assumptions there and even traveling that road, you know, the roads there, people do, have, and they do sometimes we risk their lives just to go see a doctor, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which right. sounds crazy, but yes, that's what they, and then some of them don't want to leave. Yeah. 
if they're going to miss their specialist appointments, that kind of thing. Yeah. Because there's something that's standing in the way. And it's usually something, um, a fear of some sort, mm -hmm. the, when they have to travel a certain time of the year. So I really commend you guys for the work you guys are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you to the, to the great speakers that came before us to sort of set the path. Uh, thank you very much to the conference organizers for inviting us to present today. Um, also, just want to thank the, the, um, the members of the Coast Salish Nations that welcomed us to have this conference together and to uh, acknowledge that the work that, uh, that Victoria and I are doing is, is taking place on, on this territory, on the unceded. Um, uh, territory of the Muslims, Guamish, and Sailor Tooth. So thank you very much for having us here. By way of introduction, uh, my name is David Tu. I am a, a family physician, but I'm also a, um, uh, from a settler family. I grew up in Toronto, but I've been raising my two kids here on Coast Salish territory for the last 20 years. I'm a family doctor, and I've spent the bulk, or at least the last close to 18 years, in the downtown east side with a, a focus on caring for indigenous people and families. Um, and I will let Victoria introduce herself, and then we'll go on. Um, my name is Victoria Wood, and I am a strategic lead for health systems with uh, the Vice President's Health Office at uh, UBC, and have been very privileged to be working uh, on this project, um, and I'm really coming in kind of as an outsider, um, and so I'm glad to be kind of sharing this work on behalf of the Urban Indigenous Health and Healing Cooperative, call it, call it like so yeah, I am here representing a, a, a larger group of others, and we are going to talk about a small piece of what we're doing, which is the interprofessional, interprofessional team development work that we've been doing. Um, so no official disclosures, other than that I do provide primary care at the center that I work at. I am on the board that sort of organizes um, uh, the uh, Kila Lelum. And I think the most important disclosure I want to share it's somewhat of an apology i have never been up here to talk about our program without having an elder stand beside me uh, and so i'm a little awkward and uh, told to embrace that awkwardness is a learning opportunity but um and it's again that sort of 10 minute uh discussion we we're having about going all this way to do a 10 minute presentation and i talked with uh, it's, uh normally i would have either elder roberta price or elder bruce robertson standing beside me um, and it, it just wasn't the right format, and it didn't seem respectful for me to, to ask them to kind of fit how they would teach and share this story. So hopefully we find another time with another venue where uh, the story can be told in more fuller detail. So I do just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, so I'm here to speak about a center that's really dear to my heart. Um, they, I worked, I've worked in the inner city in, in the downtown east side for, as I said, for a long time, and there was, uh, I've had long, since two, 2014, working with a team of elders um, to kind of develop initially through research and then through program like how to work together in a partnership way. And uh, a lot of work went, happened over those years, and about three years ago, at, at sort of the insistence of certain patients that we're in community members that we're working with, said, okay, you got to take this to the next level. And so a group of us led by four elders that made up the board of a nonprofit uh, non cooperative uh, came together and w this summer we opened the Kilalalalem Health Center uh, in the downtown east side at the corner of Powell and Princess. And so we are many things. We are uh, an indigenous community cultural center that also provides primary care. Um, we are a team of uh, 54 individuals. There's 12 elders that work with us at our center. There's six physicians, there's six nurses, there's two social workers, there's two counselors. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a team of people that sort of invested in creating this, this new health center, or cultural center, uh, in response to our, our years of experience of, of 
working in structures that weren't quite right, that weren't meeting the needs for, for, the, for the indigenous community people that we were looking after. So in, in many ways, a response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action. So this is just some photos of, of our center and some of the great people um, that uh, we're here to try and represent. Um, I'll say that uh, from the outset, we, we did um, embrace a number of models. And one of the models was looking at the patient-centered medical home. And so we knew that that was a good start, but not sufficient. And how do we embrace that? What plus do we add to it? And the plus that we wanted to do principally was bring the roles of uh, indigenous health providers, elders, knowledge keepers, and others uh, into, that, into, that, um, into the service that we're providing. And so how do you do, so being a new organization with like sort of like the world is our oyster, we can do this however we want. One of the things that we needed to do, we need to actually get together and, and to think this through and to plan things out. So um, amongst the many other things that were going on, you know, renovating a purpose built building, hiring people, fundraising, writing grants and all those things, we, said, we, we made some time to get together as a team to it. Um, so this is a story of our, our team getting together and what happened over the past year. And that's a photo of, uh, from, our very first work, from our first workshop. Um, the goals that we had set um, were to, one, find us all sharing a common purpose in the work that we're doing. Uh, the second was to create some sort of legacy or a guidebook of the principles and stories and practices that we're gonna generate from, from our time together um, with the aim that hopefully the end people say, I have the confidence, they may not be able to execute, but they have the confidence to at least try to provide culturally safe and effective care. And for us just to, we're a new we were a new team. Uh, some of us have been working together for many years, but in this new context, we needed those working relationships. We know that for when you're going across epistemologies, different ways of looking and understanding the world, you need to have good communication. You need to have strong relationships. You need to have trust. You need to have a, uh, all those things that allow for effect to effectively work together. So that was our, our hope to try and achieve. Um, so in terms of developing a common purpose, this is the model of service that we've evolved to. And I remember the first description was very much like a, an organogram with a couple of boxes at the top. And it's uh, informed by the, in, in, in part by the patient-centered medical home, in part by the work that we're a part of a larger network of indigenous uh, um, health center providers in on-reserve and off-reserve in Vancouver. Um, and in part just by our own iterations. So what I like about this model of service um, is that it puts culture at the center of everything that we do and it puts members and their families also in the center. Uh, it clearly defines what our purpose is and that's the two red at the top. Our, our vision is, to, is towards health equity and wellness for the indigenous and non-indigenous people in the downtown east side and we're going to do that by providing culturally safe service that enact the truth and reconciliation calls to action. So um, get every, getting everyone behind that. And in terms, when it actually comes to the day-to-day -day work, how you actually do things is has to be value-driven. And so to have a discussion and what are our shared values. And we've come to that equity and wellness, respect, kindness, the, uh, the importance of indigenous culture and knowledge and being driven by our members or our patients. That's, that's, those are the values that, that inform the day-to-day the -day work. And our, our strategies to achieve things is having the leadership of elders, of which we have three on our board, and again, uh, on all of our advisory committees, the use, importance of laughter, unconditional love and acceptance, being trauma-informed, culturally humble, uh, the importance of teaching and research, communicating well, and being focused on outcomes. So that's our model. So it might seem strangely effusive as I talk about this because I am coming as an outsider from UBC and having the privilege to work with the team to have these team development workshops. And thinking about the teams that are emerging across the province, so often teams don't do what the center has done in terms of bringing together people at the outset while they were busy, 
building the building and trying to get all the things operational to deliver care to their community, they actually did take the time to come together and say, we're going to learn from each other how to be a team. And so one of the sessions that we did, our actual se se second session, really showed me a different way of thinking and learning and being together that I've not seen in any, any other team and I would really like to see embodied in all the primary care teams that are emerging across the province and the existing teams that are trying to continually improve. So when we talked about during the second session chronic pain, the discussions that we had around that were really about trying to get a common understanding amongst the team about what we're talking about when we mean chronic pain. And when we had every member of the team in the room together, which is unbelievably powerful, and again, so few teams do this, but every single team member, including our elders and elders assistants, were in the room, and having that conversation shifted it in a direction that you wouldn't have had otherwise. And so we had people talking about intergenerational trauma. We had people, elders, sharing their stories that the team was able to learn from in a way that they wouldn't have been able to otherwise and people were coming out of that room with a bit of a common understanding and a different understanding that it, they would have had had it been just a group of clinicians talking from a clinical perspective about how to manage pain. And so that was really, really powerful and something that can't be achieved other, without bringing the team together the way that, that we did. The other thing was understanding each other's roles and responsibilities and every single member of the team having the opportunity to share what they do from a clinical perspective, but something that I'd never seen before, we call this talking walls, where the individual providers have the opportunity to put words on the page about what they feel they contribute to something like chronic pain that then other individuals can kind of add to. People put value statements on these, and that was something that I haven't seen with a lot of teams. And what we realized were there were common values that came out of this. And so we were able to input this all into one of those word-generating cloud things. Um, and this then became something that the team can hang its hat on and say, this is our common vision and our common approach to managing and dealing with and supporting individuals in this community that are living with chronic pain and having a really different understanding of what chronic pain is to what they came in with to begin with, which might have been very clinical in nature. Thanks, Victoria. I, I might just also just mention the, the community that we're serving. We have about a thousand members that we sort of, in one year we sort of soaked up a lot of people into our, into our practice and into our community. Um, and they represent about 52 different nations. About a third are coming from um, uh, the, the, the lo within 100 kilometers, but another third are coming from other parts of British Columbia, and the other third are, are from farther away, and most of those from the prairies. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really diverse group um, of people that we're caring for. Um, some of the things that we learned through this process, um, the, the most striking was just the value of actually having elders there, someone with that cultural authority who, who's, who's taken on that leadership role to guide non-Indigenous non practitioners like myself into how, how, how to do a better job. Um, and that, having that personal relationship, again, we've done some other research, just actually experiencing culture firsthand, being invited to a sweat, going, going to a feast, going to a ceremony. These are the things that are, are practice changing. Um, so more of uh, that's, the, their, also their visions and dreams for what we should be working towards as a new organization. We can kind of capitalize so much on that. Um, laughter and storytelling for many parts is just to, you got to make this fun if you want to bring people together and, and everyone's busy and, and, and so to good food, we got to work on the food more. Um, <laughs> um, but also members, to bring more members of the community. We actually, initially we didn't invite a lot of community members because that we're all a new team, we're just trying to figure ourselves out, but it's clearly something that was, uh, that people wanted more of is to actually have the full perspective, both from, uh, to, so the, those, the visions of, uh, and dreams of the members that we're serving as well as the providers. Um, uh, just that value of actually making the time to reflect and connect, and people actually want more unstructured time, just actually just time to be together, and so we try to build that in. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a chance to take on those bigger topics 
that you wouldn't otherwise be able to address, like discrimination, like racism, like the use of language. Um, uh, what, what do we mean by trauma? These things as a group, um, everyone has, has something to contribute and everyone has something to learn. So I think that is something going forward or learn. We need to do more of this, I think. And I'll leave it to, um, well, we're trying to, trying to have a legacy. So that's actually your and my job, I think, is to try and start to take these pieces and put them into some, some form of tool to communicate to those that are new or joining and trying to put all these pieces together in a, in a, in a way that is um, useful and accessible. So we'll get back to you next year with that. Um, I'm going to give you the final word. Yeah, so like I said, what I really hope that people take away from uh, this experience and what we've shared is the value in coming together as a team in a very, very purposeful way and the value of PMH+. Plus. So t primary care teams that include elders and elders assistants in the care model and then in the learning and that opportunity to bring people together to learn from each other and create new ways of practicing that are better and more inclusive and more culturally relevant. Um, and it's been such a privilege and such a blessing to work with this group and like I said, I just want everybody to be doing it this way. <laughs> okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, yeah. So, um, and then just finally, most importantly, uh, we just would like to acknowledge the uh, Vancouver Phys Physician Association for their funding that has allowed us to host these workshops, get a little bit of food, um, is really helpful too. Um, and then, of course, the team that gives of their time to come together and learn from each other and then deliver this very important care within the community. Apparently, we have time for two questions. And I promise I'll run out. Hello. Um, amazing work. It, honestly, like, it's uh, such an inspiration. And um, I think beautiful to see like, the years of work in the community and like, people coming together to do things differently. Like, I'm super impressed, and I wish all of my primary care clinics were <laughs> built in a similar fashion. And what I'm really curious about, I, I think it's great that you're working on something to kind of capture the work you've done, because I think um, as time progresses, these things can get lost, and particularly with staff turnover. And I'm not trying to sound negative, but to my mind, just thinking in kind of that system's direction. And I'm wondering, um, like what what you're kind of thinking think, uh, about sustainment and like when, when culture is so important in in the clinic setting and when you have new team members coming on and onboarding them and trying to maintain those values and I, I'm confident that with the system structure you have that like that's going to kind of support that but I'm really curious because one thing in my practice that I try to do is thinking about integrating health equity into our onboarding and and it's clear my values, but in a organization where you have new people coming from many different disciplines and epistemologies, as you mentioned, um, culture is so important, but also very amorphous and, and fragile, so, yeah. No, that's a great question. Um, and I think with the blessing of starting, starting something new is that, again, you're, you're bringing in people that actually have a lot of those values and they're attracted to this work for that reason. So we get that blessing of, of, it wasn't hard to kind of align everyone because, but the sustainability question is an important one I'm considering. Like this first two, first year and a half, you, you're all heart and enthusiasm and everyone's working crazy hours to just to, just to make become real and to, and, to, and, to, and to function. And all of our work I think in the coming year is going to be how to slow down, <laughs> how to look after each other. Um, you know, I got a quality improvement goal of just making sure that everyone has lunch every day. Yeah. People actually don't take, aren't taking their work home with them every day. Yeah. Um, and uh, we're trying to figure out the right the structure. I think what I would like to see from this workshop is actually like to actually have this as a monthly thing as opposed to every four months and just to, just to kind of normalize the fact of getting together isn't such a special huge yeah. event. It's actually normal for a group of people um, who are actually, if you're, it's different between a group of people and being a team. Teams get together and, and do things together um, as opposed to just a collection of, of, of individual practitioners. Because again, my previous clinical life, I was very much just like, I'm doing my thing with all these people around me, but I'm doing my thing. And now we're the, the whole, 
it's very different. And then you, the way you have to look after each other in this process, because you realize that I'm so, if, if I'm so reliant, I be, I, I, to, for me to do my, my job and to care for people the way I want to, I, need, I rely so heavily on so many other people that if someone else is, is not thriving, but every, you're vulnerable in that sense. So there's so much more energy and learning that we need to do about just actually how to care for each other, how to be well, how to still be service oriented and make sure that we're delivering. And we want to grow to 2,000 members as our target of what we can accomplish, but to do that in a way that, that people are, are satisfied with their personal balance. And, um, and so I think that's more my, in, I'm not worried so much about the values. The values are just intertwined in all the conversations. And I think just to reemphasize, but just actually keeping people healthy and well and connected. Is, is, is the thing that I still have, we still have to figure out as, as, as a team. But I think the, the emphasis is clear that's what we need to do. Sounds like you're on the right track. <laughs> so Megan asked us to please remind you to complete your evaluation form. So I wanted to make sure I did that for her. <laughs> yeah, you can just leave your little blue forms on your chair, please. And a big round of applause for all our presenters today. Thank you, everybody.